Hello friends, and welcome back to Dungeon Design in Zelda. Now that we've looked at the Dungeons of Zelda 1, it's time to examine a game that I've been most curious about revisiting, Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link. This might be the classic Zelda title that I have the least amount of nostalgia for, or at least it's up there. The first time I even beat the game was via the GameCube collector's disc, and I didn't do it until 2012. I'll never forget that feeling of triumph though. That said, it's a title I have revisited very few times, especially when compared to Zelda 1, which I jump into every so often to beat as a short weekend sort of game. And compared to A Link to the Past and Ocarina of Time, which are landmarks of my childhood. That said, I do have a soft spot for Zelda 2, so why revisit the game so infrequently? Well, there are a few reasons for that, but we'll circle back to that question later on in this video. Of course, the focus here is on the dungeons themselves, but as usual, there are a few pre-dungeon things to get out of the way first. Just as I did with Zelda 1, I'm going to be looking at all of this game's dungeons in this one video. I also am once again playing this game on Switch via NSO using the SNES controller because I just love this little thing. And save states, save states, save states, save states are this game's saving grace, pun intended. And hey, don't boo at me, I have nothing to prove. I have beaten this game without them before, so I know I can do it, but look, I'm an adult with a family, and I'm making a video here, I only have so much time. Between that and this game's grueling difficulty, save states are 100% my recommended way to go when playing this game. Another note I'd like to touch on about this game, which often goes understated in the Zelda community, is how influential this game actually was for the series going forward. Forward. We often think of Zelda 2 as being the black sheep of the series, but a lot of ideas established here would be carried over into future games, even more so than Zelda 1 perhaps. In particular, the more linear story setup and progression from dungeon to dungeon, and the idea of an established dungeon order. This game also offers better hints overall from villagers and NPCs when compared to Zelda 1, and overall just does a better job at guiding you in the right direction with context clues, closed off paths, and hints. Mainline Zelda games would follow this game's example more than Zelda 1 in terms of its overall structure, while incorporating the top-down view and mechanics of Zelda 1, that overall structure being with the game opening in a small area which the player explores, finds useful items, reaches a dungeon, completes the dungeon, and then uses items to reach a new area. Rinse, repeat. Zelda 1 basically opened the entire map up to us right from the start, with very few sections being locked behind items, the notable exceptions being needing the raft and ladder for certain paths. Zelda 2, on the other hand, more so resembles games like Majora's Mask, Twilight Princess, and Skyward Sword, with its sectioned off overworld areas which hide some items in dungeons and some outside of them, and needing all of these for progression. Most notable about this is that Zelda 2 divides these items between physical actual items and magic spells, the spells being found outside of the dungeon dungeons, and typically used for progression within the next dungeon, though some spells like shield and life up are pretty much applicable anywhere. And then the physical items being found within the dungeons and usually being used to reach the next dungeon once you've completed the one that you're in, mostly. There are some exceptions like the hammer, but for the most part this is the structure that the game follows, and is more or less the structure the rest of the series would adopt and keep up until Breath of the Wild. And hey, we actually have towns in this game where you can rest and recover, talk to NPCs, and get hints, and even learn new sword techniques like the up and down thrusts, which are invaluable. So yeah, we often look at the 2D side-scrolling camera perspective of this game and say, that's not Zelda! But truth be told, in terms of how we actually progress through the story, these are core foundational Zelda tropes. Of course, there is that aforementioned difficulty, but hey, Zelda 1 was hard as hell too, and even games that came after would have their fair share of difficulty. You ever play Trial of the Sword on Master Mode, anybody? Come on. But if you can get past that difficulty, there's a genuinely good game to be played here. A perfect one? Far from it. It has its flaws. But I will die on this hill when I say that this game does not deserve the bad reputation that it has. With all of that said, I'm now going to spend the rest of the video tearing it apart. So, without further ado, let's
let's head into the dungeons of the Adventure of Link. At a glance, any of Zelda 2's dungeon maps look as though they could almost fit into a Metroid game. But truth be told, despite being the basis for the best song in Smash, Zelda 2's dungeons don't have a whole lot of depth going for them. Many people complain about the side-scrolling camera perspective, but I don't think that is what holds the dungeons back. In fact, Metroid does it just fine, and is one of the most exploration-heavy franchises in, like, all of gaming. Zelda 2's fatal flaw is just the lack of variety. It feels like they were on the cusp of some pretty good stuff, but it just ends up not being bold enough to actually take the leap. So most of these dungeons feel like they're kind of playing it safe. They're just not as memorable or as fun as Zelda 1's dungeons, nor do any of them feel as creative and iconic as the dungeons of A Link to the Past and games onward. It's not all bad though. In fact, Zelda 2 gets quite a bit right within its dungeons, and even has some corrections over Zelda 1 that would impact future games. One example is the keys. Keys can now only be used within the dungeons that they are are found in, so each dungeon is now truly a fully self-contained experience from the rest. The dungeons still feature branching paths, keys, and locked doors, so you will often come to a fork in the road with one path leading to a locked door and the other path having a key at the end of it, uh, just like last time. Sometimes they'll spread these keys out to all corners of the dungeons, and sometimes they'll just have some weird and lazy placement. It feels like course correction in some ways, but without a lot of the charm that made Zelda 1 feel special. As mentioned before, dungeon items are also now far more important and integrated into the overall story progression. But where it feels like they just aren't there yet is how they fail to implement the items into the dungeons themselves. The exception is maybe the Handy Glove, which gives you the strength to break these blocks. This is found in Midori Palace, the second dungeon. It's tucked all the way to the left side side of the dungeon and will be needed to open the path leading over to the boss fight. So just like Zelda 1's ladder in level 4, they were almost there, but they really only use this concept in a single dungeon. It does feel more forgivable overall in Zelda 2 because you usually end up needing to use these items outside of the dungeons in order to reach the next dungeon. Uh, for example, in Parappa Palace, the first dungeon will find the candle, which then we can use to see in these dark caves and move down the road towards Midori Palace. And hey, we even have NPC villagers hinting towards this. Another example is the flute, which is found in the Ocean Palace, and then is used to bypass the River Devil and reveal the next dungeon, the Hidden Palace. Though some of these items feel like they just weren't very well thought out. Think about the raft and the boots. We find the raft in Dungeon 3, the Island Palace, which allows us to cross over the water. And then we just end up getting the boots from the next dungeon, the Maze Palace, which lets us cross over the water? It lets us walk on water somehow? It just feels redundant, like they needed a way to bar our progress, so they used water as an overworld obstacle twice. But why doesn't the raft just work the second time? It's kind of weird. I am getting sidetracked though. The dungeon items overall are basically just plot MacGuffins. They could be swapped out with keys and corresponding giant locked gates out in the overworld, and it would have very little impact on the actual gameplay, save for maybe that handy glove example. This time around, there are also no dungeon maps or compasses, and the samey room designs can make dungeons feel more confusing than they actually are. Seriously, how could we ditch the dungeon map? So you end up either needing to look one up or trying to make a note of the dungeon layouts, mental or otherwise. But those layouts tend to mostly be just long, straight corridors with a few branches, so it's just not quite there yet in terms of actual navigational challenge. Maybe that's why the map is gone, because these dungeons would be too easy to figure out if you weren't swept up in the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. One issue that goes 
unfixed from Zelda 1 is that there is still the potential to miss those dungeon items. In the very first dungeon, I reached the boss without the item, the candle, and had to go backtracking for it. Thankfully, we do have some way to know this time around if we've gotten everything in the dungeon or not. If you finish the dungeon and have beaten the boss and gotten the dungeon item, then the palace will collapse when you leave. If not, it'll remain open there so you can go back in and get whatever you've missed. But that feels like a band-aid solution to a problem that could have been avoided. If the items are not going to be used for progression within the dungeon, I have less incentive as a player to actually explore thoroughly beyond finding keys. So why not just put the item at the end of the dungeon after the boss or something? In terms of gameplay, it would make very little difference. Or just make the items actually matter more within the dungeons like they already do with the handy glove. Credit where credit is due, however, the game fixes the issue I complained about in Zelda 1 with tough enemies respawning, which makes backtracking within a dungeon far more manageable. And without a map, backtracking is inevitable. Some weaker enemies still do respawn, however, but you'll never run into a room full of dark nuts and then have to backtrack through it later, only to be forced to fight the horde of dark nuts again. No, thankfully no. Especially with how simple the navigation is compared to Zelda 1, most of the challenge here really is just in that punishing combat, as the navigation tends to be pretty simple, save for some weird things like fake walls, which we'll come back to in a minute. So with how tough these baddies are, especially enemies like Iron Knuckles and Lazalfos who are very good at blocking, if they respawned upon backtracking, that would make these dungeons near unbearable. Then again, they could have made backtracking less of an issue to begin with had they gone the extra mile with the dungeon layouts. Later Zelda games, and to some extent even Zelda 1, would incorporate loops in its design. You can follow a path, find an important item or key, and then be dropped off back where the path split, which just reduces tedium. Ocarina of Time's Fire Temple, for example, is basically just one giant loop back to the boss door. Zelda 2 often places keys at the end of long corridors, and then you just have to awkwardly hike back. While I'm glad those stronger enemies don't respawn because of how punishing the combat is, spending a minute walking down an empty hallway isn't that exciting either. There's gotta be some middle ground, right? The issue gets especially bad when they start implementing random dead ends. The Ocean Palace and Great Palace both have several of these. Just a long hallway with literally nothing at the end for you. So you wasted a bunch of magic and HP fighting baddies and heading down here only to be rewarded with nothing. At least put a fairy, magic drop, or some XP down here, or something. It's not a total sin, but boy is it irritating, especially this late into the game. And of course, because I complained about it already in the last video, let's not forget the magical key, which trivializes the need for locked doors entirely. This is found outside of a dungeon, in New Kasuto Town, and it's found before the Hidden Palace, so you actually have it for two entire dungeons. And unlike in Zelda 1, it isn't optional. You cannot make any progress whatsoever through the Hidden Palace without it, because the dungeon has seven locked doors before the boss fight and no keys. So if you're going to give us the unlimited keys key, what's the point of having locked doors anyways? They just cancel each other out. All they do is hold you up for half a second, and sometimes enemies can attack you while you're stuck unlocking the door. It's pointless. And that pointlessness becomes all the more apparent when you get to the final dungeon, which has no locked doors whatsoever. I do appreciate the combat system in this game a lot, though. You can't simply mash your way through enemies like in many others. Zelda games, and very rarely do they throw overwhelming groups of enemies at you. You'll never encounter more than one Iron Knuckle at a time, and if they are in the same room, then they're spread out or separated in some way. The thing is that it starts feeling pretty repetitive when the dungeon layouts are so simple, so they have to pad the dungeon out with brutally difficult enemies like those aforementioned Iron Knuckles. It got to the point where I had leveled up sufficiently, so I didn't need the XP and just tried to find ways to bypass them entirely. And that is saying something. Those who watch my live streams know that I usually go out of my way to do combat in games, to kill every enemy I encounter. But here, no, it's just not worth it. But overall, the combat system 
system itself is very good and requires a lot of tricky maneuvering to get around your opponent's defenses, and I really like that. The enemy placement overall is solid here, with just a few excruciatingly frustrating exceptions. Most egregious are these guys, these floating laser dog heads. They're apparently called Mao, and they're the bane of my existence. A single one of these, or even a pair, aren't too bad. They float in and alternate positions while firing projectiles at you, forcing you to block carefully. Okay, that's fine. The issue is when they start to swarm you. Link has four potential blocking positions, a high and low position for left and right. But what happens is that these guys start spawning in from both sides of the screen in massive numbers and alternating their height. And they always do it in these stupid hallways filled with destructible blocks where there just isn't much room to operate. I don't mind having to block enemy attacks. That's the point of having a shield, right? But it is literally impossible to not get hit here, because the game starts expecting you to block from multiple angles simultaneously. You cannot block high and low and front and back at the same time. They could solve this issue by simply restricting the amount of these guys that can spawn in at once, but they didn't. They just expect you to take the hits. Considering there are no recovery hearts in this game whatsoever, and magic that you can use to heal yourself is often scarce, just walking into a room with these guys and getting overwhelmed is an experience that almost ruins the entire game for me. It is beyond frustrating. Like, I am fine with hard games. I like them even, as long as that difficulty feels fair. Heck, I beat Metroid Dread on Dread Mode 100% twice, and I enjoyed it. But any room with these guys makes my blood boil. It is a true test of my patience. And while I'm complaining, remember how I said this game was overall less cryptic than Zelda 1? Less doesn't mean that it's entirely without its fair share of BS. I mentioned it briefly before, but for some reason they decided to put some fake walls into some of the later dungeons. And it's not like in the N64 games where you get the lens of truth that lets you see through them, or they're just really heavily telegraphed or something. You're just expected to figure out that you can jump through here. And the placement is always awful. There's a room where it would make sense, because you can see past this wall that there's a hidden room with a key. Do they place the fake wall here? No. They put it down here instead in a different room, with no way of telling you. It's not like you can just walk through it either because it's raised up. You have to jump. Who's jumping into walls for fun? If some random NPC hinted towards this, that would feel a bit better, but there's zero indication that you have to do this, and it is mandatory because it's how you get that key. Oh, and let's not forget where they decided to place the boss room in the Hidden Palace. Another exercise in BS. It's so close to being a good idea, but the execution sucks. In fact, the overall layout of this dungeon just kind of sucks. Several times in the dungeon you're passing by and jumping over these pits, but it turns out that the only way to make progress through the dungeon is by falling down them intentionally. I see this and I think, that's a death pit. I'll die if I fall. So I jump over it. Am I supposed to just allow myself to fall down? Apparently yes, but only after you've gone past them, because otherwise you'll get stuck down there and miss out on the dungeon item. So after enduring all of that and fighting swaths of tough baddies, we get to this pit, which again, looks to me like a death pit. And as we're falling down, if you can figure out that that's what you need to do, we can see that there is a hallway tucked to the side wall here. So that's where we need to go, no problem. Except you can't just try to fall carefully and land there. You have to use the fairy spell to fly over. But here's the issue, the fairy spell costs a lot of magic to use. Magic you might not have handy. And while there is a magic drop at the bottom of the chasm here, you're going to have to go fight your way through a bunch of baddies to make it back up to the top of the pit again. And so conserving magic may not be an option, because again, this game has no recovery hearts. You have to use magic to heal yourself. I got stuck here because I ran out of magic, and those magic drops 
bots that I found do not respawn. I had to resort to killing myself and respawning to refill my magic and health. You should never have to resort to that. It's the stuff like this that holds this game back. They're on the cusp of greatness here. There are tons of great ideas like an intricate combat system, having some mid bosses before dungeon items, and that overall sense of story progression. It's all very good. But then they put random, cryptic, and brutal BS stuff like this. I can look past it, but a lot of people won't. This difficult stuff tends to overshadow all the positives about this game. And it's unfortunate because Zelda 2 has garnered a really bad reputation over the years, despite me actually having a lot of fun when I'm playing it. It's just a few moments with really stupid design choices that rear their heads every now and then. And by the end of the game, they really start to add up. And then there's the Great Palace, the game's final dungeon, and boy what a double-edged sword. The best part of this dungeon is that if you get a game over, you start back at the dungeon entrance. For whatever reason, every other dungeon drops you back at the castle after a game over. Which is dumb, but they got you covered here, and thank god, because this dungeon is brutal, and that brutality is mostly because it is long and filled with tough enemies. The navigation here never really gives me much challenge. Like, yes, this pit! It's obvious that I need to drop into here, not like the pits in the last dungeon. There are still some pointless dead ends though, including one right at the start of the dungeon, but overall it's pretty much just a straight shot to the end, with a handful of deviations. It's a real combat gauntlet of a dungeon. There aren't even any locked doors in the entire dungeon. Then again, we do have the magical key, so there wouldn't be any point to them anyways, because we wouldn't need to hunt for small keys. So this final dungeon is just a test of your determination. It's clear where to go, but getting there is going to be tough. And as far as final dungeons go, I'm fine with that idea. Alright, let's review the bosses as usual. For the most part, I like the bosses in this game, and I can appreciate how the few times that they do recycle the bosses, <clears throat> Rebonac, I'm looking at you, it's to use them as mid-bosses later on. That's fine by me, because it happens far less in this game compared to Zelda 1. However, it does feel a bit lacking in variety. I mean, sure, Horsehead and Germafencer look different, but you fight them the exact same way. Almost every Every boss just has to be stabbed in the face, which granted is effective, I get that, but it's not that interesting. Karak is an exception, but he's basically just a bigger whiz robe, just like the ones we've already been fighting throughout the dungeon leading up to him, and he's killed the exact same way as them, by just reflecting his attacks. And the Thunderbird, the penultimate boss of the game, you need to use the Thunder spell on, but even then it's all face stabbing for him after that. So yeah, all of these bosses have some aesthetic differences, but they're all fought the exact same way. Link's Shadow is the final boss, and he's near impossible without using an infamous exploit. I'm always down for a tough final boss, but this might actually be too extreme, especially after having just fought a different boss in the last room. Back to back boss fights, and they're both hard. I literally have never landed a single hit on this guy without doing this crouch stab exploit. Aside from that, I actually don't have too much to say about the boss bosses here. Some good ideas, love to fight this big old dragon, and the Thunderbird is actually pretty cool, but the rest just feel redundant. So those are the dungeons of Zelda 2. Truth be told, when I first started playing through this game for this video, I kept thinking to myself, gotta get Zelda 2 out of the way so that I can play A Link to the Past again, and I am looking forward to playing that game, but overall, I actually really enjoyed my time with Zelda 2. This game has a lot of ideas that would spill over into future games, but it is held back by some pretty big flaws, and the dungeons themselves may not be the game's strong suit. I found I was actually actually enjoying my time outside of the dungeons a lot more than when I was exploring inside of them. But they aren't awful for the most part, they just don't have a lot going for them either. There are no unique mechanics or puzzles that would make them stand out. Just a lot of iron knuckles and a bunch of reused rooms and dead ends. So while I did have fun here, I know that I have some pretty niche tastes. And this game isn't the most friendly to new players. But if you are curious and up for a challenge, and can get past a few glaring flaws, there is a genuinely fun game to be had here. Just feel free to use save states shamelessly. 
Thank you so much for watching this video. Before we end this off, I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you to my patrons and channel members, including, but not limited to, Grey Mage, Brenda, Tetra, Callie, Gail, Hylian Wes, Justin, Clifford Longhead, Midnight Naomi, and Bunny. Thank you all so much for the support and for watching, and I will catch you all next time. Bye-bye! <laughs>